Well, good morning. There we go. Um, but more enthusiastic response than before, they've learned. Um, it is a joy to be with you this morning. You know, um, some of you know I spent the last week on vacation and, um, you know, doing some restful things, doing some traveling. But about 7.30 Eastern time last, uh, this week, last Sunday, I had this feeling inside me of dread because I was like, what am I forgetting? Um, I thought I'd miss worship, but turns out I had the day off. So it was just uh, my biological clock saying, ah! Um, I think there was also some longing behind that because I wasn't with you all. And so here we are, and it's a joy to be back in worship with you this morning. It's like, okay, get to the scripture. Let us uh, go to the word of the Lord in Matthew, chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. And, they were, and as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Before we dive into the scripture, I did want to say a few quick words about the walk. The study we'll be doing on Wednesday mornings from 10 to 11. Um, you know, this is a really good pr- a book, I think, to begin Lent with. Um, five essential practices of the Christian life. Worship and prayer, study, service, giving, and sharing are those five uh, practices that they focus on in this book. And I think it's a great way to get back to the basics of faith and remind ourselves what it means to be Christian by looking at the practices that Jesus um, was a part of. And so I know 10 o'clock on a Wednesday is not a time that covers everyone, but um, with other things going on Wednesday night, we wanted to have something uh, during the day. So if that works for you, there's information back in in the uh, narthex there that you can pick up. So, Transfiguration Sunday. That's what today is, Transfiguration Sunday. And and Transfiguration Sunday always happens at the end of Epiphany, which is the season that comes after Christmas, starts in the beginning of January, and then always comes right before Lent, um, which we are approaching, starts on Ash Wednesday, this Wednesday, and then the next Sunday will be the first Sunday of Lent. So Transfiguration Sunday happens right here before some things and after some others. And um, I remember in preaching class in seminary, they told me, never start your sermon with a dictionary definition because that's as boring as I'll get out. But that's exactly what I'm going to do this morning um, because I don't think that the word transfiguration, transfigure, is something you probably use in your everyday uh, conversation. At least I don't. and if you do, props. But for the rest of us, um, I think the Oxford English Dictionary can help us out a little bit this morning. To transfigure means to transform into something more beautiful and elevated. To transfigure means to transform into something more beautiful or elevated. And I love the example that, that's given here. Um, so, so, for example, we might say of a mother seeing her daughter perform on stage for the first time, her face face seemed transfigured by happiness. So you you can imagine, especially those of you that are parents, seeing a a child do something where they're using their God-given talents and gifts for the first time and following their dreams, it can fill you uh, 
um, with happiness, so much so that you might be glowing or seemingly transfigured. And so to say that of Jesus, it, it means that, that the three disciples with Jesus on the mountain saw him transform into something more beautiful, more bright and dazzling and elevated than they had ever seen. And as a way of revealing that this Jesus was indeed beyond the earthly realm. And so Transfiguration Sunday is the day in the Christian year when we focus on Jesus as the bridge, the bridge between the human nature and what we all know and what Jesus knows, and the divine nature, the perfect nature beyond even our comprehension. And so it's where we focus on that bridge and we think about our own transformation. It's, it's what we do on this day. And if we, if we look at, at the, the scripture that we read this morning of transfiguration, it's kind of a, an interesting story. And so it was Peter, James, and John were being led up to a high mountain um, by Jesus. And we know as we read scripture that important things tend to happen on mountains. We know of uh, Mount Sinai with Moses and the Ten Commandments. And, and Jesus gives a, a pretty long sermon on the mount um, you might be familiar with that. It's one of his most extensive works of preaching. Important things tend to happen on the mountain. And so here we are, high on the mountain, and they are there, the disciples, and they see Jesus transfigured. His clothes turn dazzling white, and they are in awe. And then um, Elijah and Moses are there with him. And it's just this really interesting and fascinating story. And so they're up there, and this is my favorite part of the story. Peter says to Jesus, it is really great that we're here. This is a really good thing. Why don't we just uh, build three houses? One for you, and one for Elijah, and one for Moses, and we just kind of like hang out, man. What do you think about that, Jesus? And, and so I imagine that Peter keeps going on and on and on, and then it says, while he was still speaking, a, a voice from the heavens overshadowed him. And it said, this is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Careful listeners and readers might know that these are the same words um, at the beginning of our epiphany season when we thought about Jesus' baptism that were said as the Holy Spirit came down, this is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. So this transfiguration on the mountain is a confirmation of who Jesus was in his baptism. And, and, and so it's at this time that Peter, James, and John fall to their knees. They fall to their knees in awe and fear and in trembling at what had all just gone down. And Jesus comes over and says, get up, <laughs> and do not be afraid, and then ushers them down the mountain, and says, don't tell anybody about what you just saw until the Son of Man raises from the dead. A fascinating and in some ways bewildering and curious story, but it makes me think about my life and, and, and in your lives about those mountaintop moments that we have, sometimes in big and extraordinary ways and sometimes in smaller ways. When have you felt like you were on the mountaintop where you were close to God, God was present to you in a very particular way? It could be on a bench, on Lake Aquabi, or watching a sunrise, or you've had something miraculous happen in your life, or you've been on a trip or gone to an event. You, you know, one thing for me, some of you know that I felt my call to ministry, sensed that, discerned that, at summer camp, at church camp. And I'm just curious how many of us, young or old, have an experience of church camp. I'm just kind of curious. Okay, okay, about the same as the first service. Um, for me, going to ch uh, church camp every year was a moment of being drawn into the closeness and the presence of God. Um, and I know that isn't the experience for everyone, but for me, the worship and the speakers helping me wrestle with stuff as a young person um, and, and being able to pray with people and wash other people's feet. I don't know if you ever had a chance to do that. But this experience of, of being with people 
who are on fire for Jesus help me discern my own calling and it helped me be at the mountaintop. Every week, um, every summer, it was one week, we would go and I knew that I was going to come out my cup overflowing on fire for Jesus. And I still look back fondly on those mountaintop experiences. Of course, you know, it was the usual case that we would come back and we would return to our school and our homes and, and church and things just wouldn't be the same. And uh, it's, it's not as if there weren't people that loved us and like-minded folks, but it just wasn't the same as that mountaintop experience where we were so closely experienced the presence of God. Maybe this has happened for you on a mission trip where you have served with like-minded people and served alongside people and, and gotten to learn about culture and uh, being able to use your skills and your gifts to do good in the world and develop relationships with those that you were serving with. And then you, you come back and you remember that mountaintop moment. Perhaps it was even service on top of a mountain. Um, anytime we have an experience where we just keenly feel God's presence. We might call those mountaintop moments. Perhaps you've been to a retreat or you've, again, just been looking at nature and seen God's presence clearly. And the truth is, I think we need these mountaintop moments. For Peter, James, and John, this was a, a miraculous moment of confirmation of who Jesus was and how truly amazing it was to be in his presence. We need these moments in our lives to be reminded of the glory and the majesty and the awe of Jesus. And more, amazing, more than an amazing idea or rules or ethics, it's a reminder that indeed Jesus came to transform us. Part of our salvation is transformation. Jesus comes to transform. And we need those moments of closeness and particularly mountaintop moments to be reminded. And I think the truth is when we don't take that time and set time aside to be close to God, we can be, we can be at risk of burning out or getting worn down. And I think that's why um, as pastors in the United Methodist Church, Pastor Tim and I and any pastor are, are given time in their year to, for spiritual rest and renewal one week every year that's not vacation is, is available to pastors to take time to recenter, to refocus, to trek up the mountain so that they can come back down and, and get back to work. Um, and and I, that's part of the reason why Pastor Tim took what's available to pastors every four years a, a full month. Every so often you need those moments to be reminded of what you're doing and why you do it. And yet... And yet, as Peter, James, and John were atop the mountain, they were so tempted and so wanted to set up shop on the mountain, and Jesus calls them down. Because the fact of the matter is, living out the gospel of life and truth and grace and abundance for all people can't be done in solitude on a mountain. You need both, but you got to come down. And in fact, I would contend that most of the work of Christ that we see in Scripture doesn't happen on the mountain. We see important things uh, given to us from the mountaintop, but that's so that we can come down and use it and get to work. You might know that we have uh, a weekly meal here called Open Table for those who are hungry in the community. It's one of uh, several places where churches and nonprofit organizations that seek to help those who are hungry, who are food insecure. But we can't do that kind of work from on top of the mountain. You might know that we have a dedicated group of folks who visit our homebound and nursing home members, um, which the list is between 70 and 80 when you count everyone people who, who can't make it to church all of the time but are still yoked to our community and an important part of our community. But we can't do that kind of work from on top of the mountain. You might know that last year, or you might not know that last year, 
We helped 94 people with over $20,000 in rental assistance and utilities assistance for people that just needed uh, to get from point A to point B, had a bad month, a bad week, a bad year. But we can't do that kind of important Jesus-like work from on top of the mountain. And you probably know that we are called to be like Jesus by putting our hands and feet to work as the body of Christ. Yet we can't do that from on top of the mountain. Even as we are called up to be with Jesus in a transformative way, I would contend that our transformation is not complete until we come down and get to work. Both experiences are equally transformative. You see, the disciples atop the mountain wanted to stay there because I think in a way it would mean they could dictate the terms and agreement and constraints of their transformation. Wouldn't we all like to be transformed on our own terms? You, you can take this part and you can change that a little bit, but, but don't touch this part. I don't want that transformed. I'm fine with that part of my life. If they stayed up top, they wouldn't actually have to put their changed hearts into practice. They would just get, be, get to be with Jesus, which is a pretty cool and important thing. And I want you to hear me say that this morning. We need to take time to be with Jesus. But that work is put into practice, not just on top of the mountain. And I don't think what Peter and James and John were after was what Jesus was after. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, might, might think about this connection as calling it a connection between holiness in heart and holiness in life. And, and I love, I return to that a lot in my own faith as I think about um, the ebbs and flows of faith and what is important to what makes me a Christ follower. The time that we spend on the mountaintop cannot be separated from the time we spend in acts of mercy and justice. In fact, they fuel one another. We need both. Our faith is not much of a faith if it's not put into action. And so the last thing I kind of want to say this morning is that as we think about these mountaintop moments, we often need those so that we can be reminded of them when we find ourselves in the valleys. Whether it's the valley of the shadow of death, the valley of mental illness or addiction or anxiety, the valley of not knowing how things might turn out, the valley of hurt and betrayal on the part of our part or from someone else, the valleys that we find ourselves in can separate us, at least we think, from the love of God. But it's those mountaintop moments that remind us that Jesus is always there on the way up the mountain, on top, on the way down, and in the deepest pits with an outstretched arm saying, I'm with you. I'm here to offer you healing and hope and forgiveness. And that's the kind of solid rock, if you will, that we can build our faith upon. And so I think as we approach Lent, I want us to, to think about it in this way. From a place of seeking to draw closer to God wherever we're at on the mountain. What can we do to keep that fire burning? One of the things you might consider during Lent is either taking something on or giving something up. Um, taking something on, a, a practice that would help you draw closer to God and keep that fire burning or restart the fire. Or letting go of something, shedding something that is getting in the way of your relationship with God, the relationship with others. Um, whether that's a practice, a habit, um, a relationship that is toxic in your life, or any number of things that separate us from God. And so I want us to think about that as we enter this time of Lent. How can we trek up the mountain in order to be led down? For indeed, when Peter and James and John witnessed the transfiguration and heard the voice from heaven, they fell to their knees and were scared. And Jesus says, comes over to them, touches them, and says, 
Get up and do not be afraid. For he would be with them until the end of the age. Indeed, my friends, this is good news, is it not? Let us pray. Good and gracious God, there are many stopping points along the mountain where we can stop and take in your presence. But we know that we are called to go atop the mountain in order to be brought down. Help us as your followers, as your ambassadors in this world to come down from the mountain, to get up, and to put to work our faith. For indeed, you are with us at every point in the journey, drawing us closer to you and drawing us into new life. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.